and distinguished participants. Good morning. Good morning. Onesmas Mtel is my name. I work with the Advocates Coalition for Development and Environment. And uh, very excited to uh, see you, those who are physically here and those uh, who are online. Uh, on my own behalf, and on behalf of a court, and on behalf of Global uh, Financial Integrity and Cisco, the Civil Society Coalition of Oil and Gas, I take this opportunity once again to welcome you and thank you for finding time to join us in our discussion this morning. Uh, some of you probably may have been wondering why is it financial flows in Uganda and especially today but this is a, a very big issue, not only in Uganda, but also at the continental level and the global level. It is of particular interest uh, Uganda because as you well know, last year we launched a strategy that looks at the domestic resource mobilization. How can you increase the revenues that are generated internally to be able to finance development and development projects? And that has been a struggle for most African countries. Yet we realize that actually there is a lot of illegal money or money that is leaving the continent, leaving Uganda in an illegitimate way that would actually benefit and help a country like Uganda finance its development projects. So broke financial integrity which is a, a US-based yeah. does, does research and advocacy, advocacy. and particularly on, uh, on uh, financial goals, and Cisco are partnering and working together to increase research, debate, and advocacy on EC financial policy. And uh, having done uh, um, such studies, we also made some proposals. We thought that this morning we should have a discussion with uh, a few of you. Some of you have been able to make it physically, but also others um, online, so that we start this debate. And that's why I'm excited that you've been able uh, to make it. Uh, I don't know whether James will allow, but uh, probably we may not go into uh, the introduction that I can see we are running here and people are been waiting online. So we may not do that, but subsequently as we go into the discussion with the primary, you'll be able uh, to introduce yourself as um, you make uh, your contribution observation. So the way we've structured it is that we're going to have a panel that is going to share with us the insights uh, about the subject, and then we'll have a plenary where we can make our own uh, contribution. And as you can see from the program, this morning we have prepared it uh, have uh, one of our colleagues uh, from uh, uh, local financial integrity, Mrs. Lakishme Kumar, 
who is the policy director and uh, she's going to be sharing with us um, her insights and she, therefore she's one of our uh, panelists this morning we have uh, uh, Dr. Dan Gabrano, uh, who is, uh, I like to call him a professor of law. That's where he's uh, probably, you know, he, because the professor is the tough thing. But uh, in other many places, Dan Gabrano will be a good professor now. But you know, Makere to be a professor, you have to go through. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a little fire. Um, but also allow me to introduce uh, Mr. Michael Oroku, okay? I hope I pronounced it well. Who is the Deputy Executive Director at the Financial Intelligence Authority? And I must say, we are privileged to have you here this morning. Uh, to share with us the experience and what is happening uh, from uh, your side. And we have our own James Mgendo, who is the national coordinator for the Civil Society Coalition of Water and Gas, who is going to do um, the moderation. Once again, thank you very much uh, for making it. Uh, let me hand over uh, to uh, James, invite uh, 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 the panelists to take their seats here, and then we'll proceed with our discussion. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Onesmas, uh, uh, for that uh, round of introduction. Um, I'm going to request uh, Mr. Michael Olupot to come and join us here at the front. And uh, with us online is uh, Lakshmi uh, from uh, Global Financial Integrity. Uh, Lakshmi, please, uh, you can uh, turn on your camera uh, for the participants. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, the members are present here. As introduced, my name is James Muhindo. I'm the national coordinator of the Civil Society Coalition on Oil and Gas. And uh, I'm uh, really privileged to be share, uh, moderating this session. Uh, many of you who are here present, it's because of the different uh, work and the different capacities in which uh, you're working uh, that have a bearing on illicit financial flows. Uh, we all understand that uh, with uh, the COVID pandemic that hit uh, the globe uh, last year, countries are grappling with the challenge of uh, raising revenues. And because of that challenge, countries have, uh, it's upon uh, the policymakers and uh, those in uh, governance to see to it that any uh, expenses or any money that was being lost uh, to any cause is brought back to the pool if we are to survive uh, during uh, the post uh, all the pandemic era. So illicit financial flows are one of the ways through which countries lose revenue. And uh, we have quite uh, able uh, panelists who are going to take us through what exactly are illicit financial flows, how are they manifesting in our country, and uh, which sectors are uh, red spots, and what is the government doing to plug some of the loopholes that are being highlighted by the members. Um, we are going to start with uh, uh, Lakshmi. Uh, to share with us uh, what exactly are illicit financial flows, how do they manifest, and what are the correlationship between illicit financial flows and uh, socioeconomic perspectives of life. So uh, for the next uh, 10 or so minutes, we are going to allow uh, Lakshmi to share with us from their perspective as Global Financial Integrity, uh, an organization that has been monitoring illicit financial flows uh, 
uh, for years, what do you make of uh, illicit financial flows? Uh, you can introduce yourself and then go ahead, Lakshmi. Um, thank you so much, James. Good morning to everyone over there in, in uh, Kampala. Are you muted? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not muted. Can you hear me? Uh, please just hold on. I think I'll have. Okay, go ahead. Um, can you hear me now, James? Yes, we can. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, you know, if not for COVID, I would have been in Kampala, and I'd much rather be with all of you in um, Uganda than sitting here in Washington, D.C. doing this. Um, my name is Lakshmi Kumar. I am the Policy Director at Global Financial Integrity. We're a think tank based in Washington, D.C., and we work at the intersection of illicit financial flows, trade, and the impact that they have on um, countries' economies. We were incredibly excited to partner with um, Accord for the last year, in the, the last well over a year that we've been working on this to put together essentially the material that all of you see before you uh, on your tables and on your desks, on your tables in front of you. Now the question might be, you know, simply asked, what is the value? Why did we do something like this? What is the need for us to talk about illicit financial flows? What is the value add that this document provides to stakeholders? And I want to emphasize that what we're trying to put together really is something that is useful, whether you're civil society, whether you're in the private sector, if you're a financial institution like a bank trying to formulate policy, whether you're the government, or whether you're a journalist trying to understand these issues. And the one thing it, on the face of it doesn't seem obvious is that we have talked about issues of human rights, um, environmental justice, corruption, money laundering, gender equality, natural resource governance, you know, extractives by and large, terrorism. What is it that connects all of this? What connects all of these themes, whether you're talking about sort of, you know, fighting child trafficking or human rights or forced labor or, you know, um, or, or sort of essentially money laundering is that there is a financial theme that runs through all of it. Even if, if, if you're involved in an enterprise that is, you know, trafficking women, as we often see that, you know, a lot of women in Uganda are trafficked for labor in um, the Gulf regions. What, what is it that, that connects all of this is that someone is making money through all of this. And what connects all these disparate, very different themes is that someone is making money. So the way to address and one of the solutions to solve the problem is to essentially go after the money that people are making. If you can find a way to cut off their assets, cut off the ways in which they are able to move this money from all these illegal activities you can essentially find a solution. And sitting in DC, um, we spent the last 10 years trying to get beneficial ownership passed in the US. It took us 10 years. And in the 10 years, um, we only got it passed 2020 December. That is how long it took us. But what we were able to do and we, what we were able to show the government, we were able to show other civil society journalists is that no matter which facet of life you take, there is always, no matter which illegal activity you take, there is a, what, the one connecting theme is that someone is trying to make money from it. And so if you identify, if you're able to tap the, the structures, the methods, the channels through which this money is being made, you have a solution that can provide at least a government a much more easier way to tackle a lot of these problems. And I think that underscores the point that a lot of you have already seen um, I think through sort of the work with that the EITR is already doing in Uganda, just the value and benefit of beneficial ownership. Um, you know, beneficial ownership is essentially in, in, in its simplest terms, the ability to identify one individual. That is the, that is you have to identify a human being that is actually behind all these transactions. And what I think we are trying to do here is to provide both the government, journalists, civil society, a set of context-based examples, which is we wanted all the examples. Accord and GFI wanted 
you know, if you're saying that, why is it that beneficial ownership will help with something like human rights abuse? We wanted to be able to give you a series of examples where, you know, for example, where women are being trafficked across into um, the Gulf of forced labor. Human trafficking sometimes accounts for over 550 trillion Ugandan shillings annually globally. And so knowing that, you know, the women and children and young girls that are being trafficked out of Uganda, very often these are companies that are owned by people who don't always give their names. So knowing that that person behind it is a way to address essentially what is a human rights abuse that is occurring. Now, very similarly, um, you know, when Uganda prosecuted its first money laundering case in 2017, what they found is they, you know, the individuals who stole, and you'll see that right at the beginning of, of that fact sheet, is that the people that stole the money, um, the people that stole the money from the commercial bank invested it in homes, other assets. And so again, what ties it is the ability to identify an individual. Now, when we talk about gender equality, um, I think, you know, it's I don't think it's a surprise to say that in terms of, you know, the way, for example, adverse health conditions affect people, women, tend, it tends to disproportionately affect women. And you see that, you know, in cases of, you know, HIV and other diseases where women tend to, be, tend to be disproportionately affected. And also women tend to be, tend to disproportionately also require state benefits, whether it's through, you know, maternal health care or other services that are being provided women often are more on the on the recipient end of government services therefore when you see money being lost from it the people that are the, the you know the section of society that is first targeted or feels its ill effects often are women and children now how does this tie into something as complex as financial transparency and beneficial ownership Simply put, you know, um, there is, I think a lot of you already in this room because of the way you work are familiar with the Global Health Fund. You know, it's, it's, it's a fund that was put to help sort of help with some of, you know, tubercle, the fight against tuberculosis, malaria, HIV. Since going back since 2005, there were, the fund and it, the fund, the money that has gone to sort of the Ministry of Health has been repeatedly hit by corruption scandals. You know, some of them have already been prosecuted. But what is interesting is in a lot of that, the patterns, the way criminals who are doing human rights abuse, corruption abuse, money laundering, uh, the way they're abusing the extractive sector, all of them form, use the same methodology, which is all of them take the money. They try to hide it within companies that you don't know who's the owner of it. They hide, try to hide it in you know, other assets like luxury vehicles or homes. So with the government having the knowledge of who is actually behind these companies makes it easier. For example, when we talked about you know, the money over 65.8 billion Ugandan shillings move, moving out, which was essentially earmarked for the Ministry of Health moving out, you know, investigations found in Uganda through you know, the Ugandan uh, uh, Department of Justice investigations found that this money was moved through 400 different private entities, all which existed on paper. They did not have actually real people behind it. They did not have real individuals. And this is not just something that, you know, we talk about the domestic implications. This is, as, as Onesmus has said at the beginning, when we talk about the ability of Uganda to sort of collect domestic resource mobilization, it's also the question of making sure that foreign entities that are investing, doing business, or for entities that are moving capital out of Uganda also have a responsibility and there's a way to track them. One of the examples you'll see in our fact sheet um, that we've put together is about a Chinese firm in Uganda that was had a contract to build ships, but essentially they were illegally taking on sand mining and moving sand out of Uganda. And, and that's, that is essentially an investment opportunity where the benefits of it should have gone to Uganda, but they're unable to do it because what is a foreign company is conducting an illegal activity and moving profits. And the way around it is for, for the ability of justice to carry forward is to know who is the individual. It's not enough to have the local lawyer. It's not enough to have the employee's name. 
for, 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 for real meaningful action and for the real ability to make sure resources are kept within Uganda for the benefit of Ugandans is the need to pass legislation. And one of the things we suggest amongst all, a lot of other things is one, is the civil society, because sometimes we see that human rights groups, environmental justice groups, they all work separately. What is important to understand is that there are common tools that can apply irrespective of the area you work. Financial transparency tools can, can buttress and strengthen the advocacy work that you're doing. And for organizations that come from sort of a variety of fields to come together around it is a real ability to make things move forward. And that is the same thing which we see with government. I think, you know, when you go to the government, you want policy making to be evidence-based. I know we have, you know, an excellent speaker from the Financial Intelligence Authority that I'm very grateful to share a stage with. For, for the FIA or for the, for the Ugandan Central Bank, for the government to make policy, they want evidence-based policy. So to be able to say that beneficial ownership of passing financial transparency laws affects not just the extractive sector, it affects gender equality, affects human rights, it affects environmental justice. I think what Accord and GFI wanted to do is to be able to show you evidence-based case examples where you can say this is why this law has such an impact in every facet of Ugandan life because we have tried to take examples from almost every area that is topical, that affects people, that affects the organizations that um, work with you. I know we started late, so the last thing I want to do is to sort of take up more time, but I would encourage everyone to strongly peruse this, ask us questions, because, you know, beneficial ownership is the big ticket item. And I'm happy to talk about sort of Uganda's current law and how we can move forward. But what I think we want to sort of really emphasize is that financial transparency is not just for finance for the for purposes of sort of you know financial law money laundering it financial transparency tools can be used in a multitude of areas in a to deal with a multitude of issues because there is always money behind every criminal activity um, with that i will not take up more time i will uh, let james sort of you know uh, take charge again and, and and help move the conversation along so that others can also um, provide you ex their excellent excellent insights this morning and give her a round of applause for those uh, uh, insights. And uh, thank you. And for sharing some of the uh, things that uh, Global Financial Integrity has found out over the years. And it's uh, also good to note, as you mentioned in uh, your uh, presentation, that uh, institutions like the Ministry of Justice, the Financial Intelligence Authority, are already uh, taking initiatives to unearth some of the monies that are being lost, uh, just like the revenues you said were lost in the Ministry under health. And also she emphasized the fact that illicit financial flows, which are in essence moving of money or value from one country to another, uh, doing it in a way that is illegitimate, uh, affects every aspect of life. It extends to health, uh, to uh, extractives, agriculture, mining, and so on and so forth. So there are areas that are a bit more prone to illicit financial flows than others. And uh, I think uh, with us, we are going to have the privilege of uh, hearing uh, from Dr. Dan Gabirano to share with us uh, some of the findings or issues they have uh, noted, especially in the extractive industry in respect to illicit financial flows. So uh, Mr. Dr. Dan, over to you. Off. Thank you very much, uh, James. Uh, my fellow panelists and everyone present in the room and online, it's a real pleasure to be here this morning. Talk about this uh, very topical and I uh, really very important uh, Financial flow. Um, I want to thank Lakshmi for painting quite a good picture of uh, what these financial flows are from a global perspective, but also from the Ugandan perspective. Now, my presentation is going to really focus more about the petroleum sector 
and um, to, I don't know if James is able to project that. Um, yes. But essentially, a study was done about illicit financial fraud, fraud, risk factors in the general care sector. Uh, some time last year, we completed early this year. Um, and to give you an insight of why this could have been an area of research, a priority area of research, I want to start with the finding of uh, the high level of panel on illicit financial fraud in Africa. Okay. Okay. Uh, as you know, yeah. it's very yeah, it's the okay. Economic Commission of Africa appointed a high level panel of uh, experts to study this uh, um, you know, IFF scenario. And one of the key things that they came up with, one of the key findings was that they caught countries that are rich in natural resources and countries with inadequate or non existent institutional architecture are the most at risk of falling victim to illicit financial flow. So this sort of drove the motivation for the research uh, because, as you know, Uganda is uh, headed to oil production uh, maybe in a few years. Um, and uh, that really gives the background. So um, let's go to introduction. So essentially, I think, and this has already been pointed out, that we know that Africa has been uh, donor dependent on, uh, you know, dependent on both aid and debt for a long time. But these are increasingly unsustainable. Um, and in this case, then resource wealth becomes a very important tool for filling the gap and boosting domestic uh, revenue. Now, it's expected that Uganda will earn about 50 billion United States dollars uh, from its uh, oil uh, activities. And so far, about a billion United States dollars has been realized. That story is um, contentious because we know that the first crop of commercial oil has not come out. But if you've been following, we've been able to collect a number of taxes, capital gains taxes, um, and a number of other revenues from the sector, almost a billion shillings. Uh, of course, there are other sphere of uh, ripple effects of uh, oil and gas production, employment, and so on and so forth. But whether Uganda um, um, derives value from its um, oil prospects would definitely depend on, uh, you know, proper management of revenues and the sector as a whole. Um, and that's why um, then this financial flows become an, an important aspect. In terms of, you know, again, generally, I, I, I have about 15 minutes to run through uh, just to sort of give some sort of general picture. But in terms of sector developments, we have recently had um, quite comprehensive laws uh, enacted um, from 2013 onwards. And what these laws do is that they provide for sector regulation, they put in place environmental safeguards, health and safety safeguards, uh, rights of affected communities, etc. They are not perfect, but it's a good beginning. We have started from a better place than many other places in Africa. Um, the laws also establish institutions. Uh, many of them are now fully operative. The Victorian Authority of Uganda, the National Oil Company, the Directorate of Victoria. But importantly, we have also uh, come up with one of, uh, in my opinion, quite a progressive public finance management law uh, of 2015, which provides oversight, um, financial controls. Uh, of course, there are challenges, uh, like I mentioned, the wide discretion of the minister. I don't want to mention that. The major challenge, however, at this moment is how to safeguard these revenues um, from external leakages and ensuring that international companies pay a fair share of their revenues under the law. Um, okay, now we dive into used financial flows. There have been a number of definitions given. Um, I want to pick one, um, which I find quite comprehensive from global financial integrity, and that is the movement of money and value from one country to another that are illicitly earned, illicitly transferred, and or illicitly utilized. Uh, so the aspect of movement from one country to another is important, and the aspect that this money is uh, illicitly and transferred or utilized. What's the effect of uh, IFM? So um, according to a 2010 study, um, it found that Africa lost an estimated United States dollars one trillion to IFFs. 
Uh, the high level panel that I earlier alluded to um, found that Africa loses about 50 billion United States dollars per year. And very recently, I think March 2020, the Brookings Institute um, conducted a study which found that between 2018, Africa lost about United States dollars 1.3 trillion. This is almost the same amount of development assistance that Africa has received during this period. So it seems to be a balance in that respect that if Africa was guarding against these items, perhaps we do not need this kind of government assistance. Um, another report uh, by the UN Conference on Trade and uh, Development, which again came out uh, early last year, uh, again puts the instance of IFFs, particularly in the extractives at United States dollars, 40 billion per year and 278 billion over a period of 10 years. Now, um, I won't deliver the point. I think Lakshmi has really done a good job to show the nexus between IFFs and development and human rights. Essentially, they deny countries critical revenue to provide uh, public goods and services and meet their goals under the sustainable government goals and human rights obligations. But they also challenge the legitimacy of the tax system because it means that the multinationals will not pay their fair share while small uh, micro, sorry, SMEs uh, bear the greatest plant of uh, tax. Now, uh, as I already pointed out, source-rich countries like Uganda are vulnerable to IFFs, and the reason is that um, the extractives generally are complex. Um, they involve elaborate global value chains that are difficult to understand, especially in countries like Uganda, without the much capacity. But also tennis is vital to invest a lot of discretion in uh, small cliffs and particularly the exigent. Perhaps you see this in the Ugandan sector as well. But I think the most critical point is that there's a dominance of multinational companies. Um, let's just also have a broad picture about IFFs and uh, the extent they affect Africa. If you look at the high level panel report, you find that Nigeria lost about 217.7 billion United States dollars. These are staggering amounts of money, um, Angola, Algeria, Sudan, DC. Going back to the Brookings study, you find that of the 10 countries with the highest distance of IFFs, nine of them depend on extractive industries. So if you look at that list, I think it's only Ethiopia that does not quite depend on extractives. Uh, and that tells you that if Uganda does not take precaution, um, Perhaps may face the same fate. Now, broadly, we look at the potential sources or drivers of illicit financial flows in Uganda's petroleum sector. Uh, there are basically three commercial activities corruption and crime. And I'll go into this very briefly. Um, when it comes to commercial drivers, the challenges here are to do with double taxation agreements and equal petroleum production sharing agreements best erosion profit sharing um, strategies of companies. Um, again, DTS, DTTs as they are, are agreements through which state parties voluntarily agree to restrict uh, their ability to tax economic activity. Essentially, they are designed to prevent double taxation and attract the DI. But there's been growing debate on whether they actually achieve this. Um, and most of these have been debunked because Evidence shows that um, one, DTAs have actually promoted double non taxation because there are other ways to avoid double taxation than these agreements. But, but also, in truth, it's that they don't really um, it says, provide such a huge incentive for, for uh, FDI. Um, you look at the 2010 study done on Uganda, you find that Australia is the second largest source of FDI in Uganda. And yet there's no DTA between Uganda and Australia. At the same point, you find that the Uganda Mauritius double taxation agreement, but only United States dollars, 31.381 million um, has been realized. So Australia then outmatches Mauritius. And then, then the, the conversation becomes whether this uh, DTA with Mauritius has facilitated uh, FDI as um, was thought. But again, if you look at the Netherlands, which is the largest source of FDI to Uganda, this by 2010, you find that um, um, companies from Australia brought, sorry, from Netherlands brought in about 3.7 billion United States dollars. But of this, 
own United States dollars, uh, 179 million came directly from uh, uh, Dutch companies. So the rest was from what we shall see are referred to as mailbox uh, companies. In total, Uganda has about 10 uh, DTS and is currently negotiating uh, an 11. Um, but what is of, what they will note here is that all the three major players, uh, that of course on its way out um, in the oil sector, all Ugandan operations through Dutch subsidiaries. And why? Because the Netherlands, um, for the most part, exempts dividend payments from withholding taxes, but also imposes a slight less about 10% withholding tax uh, on interest. If you compare that with the Uganda UK double taxation agreement, uh, you find that both dividends and interest are subject to about 15% withholding tax, same as the Income Tax Act of Uganda, meaning that Ugandan companies pay about that. So the question is why should oil companies be exempted? And from just the Netherlands, Uganda double taxation treaty, a recent Oxfam study has uh, come to the conclusion that Uganda is likely to use about United States dollars, 287 million in withholding taxes. Um, again, that's an illustration of the Netherlands. So you have, um, 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 James, if you could move to the next slide, please. Yes, so you, you have companies, instead of uh, remitting directly dividends and interest to the Netherlands, in this case, which is a third country, they prefer to go, sorry, to, to China or uh, France, where these companies are domiciled. They prefer to go to the Netherlands because then they are able to save on how much they pay on dividends. If they were to go the direct route, they would have to pay 15% withholding tax. But if they come down, uh, go through the Netherlands, they pay 0 to 5%, and interest would be 10%. These are quite a number of sums that companies save by doing that. Uh, we have a broad comparison. Um, sorry, James, I keep <laughs> inconveniencing you. No, it's okay. We have a general comparison about uh, the next slide, please. Thank you. So if you look at um, all those DTAs that are active in Uganda, you find that the Netherlands offers the most generous uh, provisions, whether for dividends, interest, royalties, technical services. Um, the other issue is about the equal production sharing agreements. As you know, um, most of the countries like Uganda cannot afford uh, the capital requirements, the technical requirements required to explore and grow their resources. So they have to turn international oil companies. Uh, and so these companies enjoy and much leverage in the negotiation of uh, these uh, production sharing agreements. Um, and as a result, uh, they tend to uh, favor the companies more than states. And, and one key issue that usually comes out the issue of stabilization clauses and tax exemption. So they insist on this. And what that means is that countries like Uganda cannot change their laws, even in changed circumstances maximize uh, the revenue potential of uh, their uh, resources. Um, again, commercial resources, we look at uh, BEPS, essentially making profits disappear in Uganda uh, and appear in places like tax havens where uh, the tax rates are zero or very negative. And this happens in a number of ways. One is through price manipulation, um, where essentially and, and happens because most of these companies are related. So it's a brother and a sister in a sense trading. Um, so they wouldn't trade at the market price. They would trade at the price that enables them, um, the, you know, enables one of the companies to earn more, the one registered in the uh, tax haven, while the one registered in Uganda shows that it has not earned that much. So the, the tax then becomes very uh, negative. But they can also inflate costs, and we have had these issues come up. The 2016 Auditor General's report has found that companies had claimed up to 34 billion United States dollars um, in ineligible costs. Um, in Mozambique, it's even worse because um, um, companies there are found to have exaggerated costs by millions and billions of United States dollars. So, um, maybe also quickly to speak about. Um, uh, price shifting, you may want to know that some of the oil companies are also involved in the establishment of crude oil pipeline. Now, that's a project that is subject to tax rate of 10, day, of 10 years. 
And so what technically may happen is that they may, um, you know, infringe the cost of transportation along the, 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 the pipeline uh, just to shift a greater part of the profits there. Um, and definitely they will enjoy it, you know, tax solid and exemption. And a study has recently been done to, to find that an inflation by just one United States dollars would lead to a revenue loss of about, again, close to about uh, another dollar. That's quite a lot of uh, money. Um, perhaps in practice, essentially what I've been talking about, uh, instead of a company uh, going direct into the final consumer, it goes through a tax haven, charges a less uh, amount of $40, um, you know, in the tax haven. Remember, there's zero tax or negligible tax. So then the country, the shell company in the tax haven would sell to another different country, third country in this case, at $100, um, meaning that there's a profit of $60. But remember, this is not going to be taxed or be probably taxed at 5%. And then the final consumer buys the product at $110. US If you want to know what Uganda is losing, if it was to sell directly, you would impose a 15% uh, on the United States dollars, $110 or even 30 percent for that part of its corporate tax and all that is lost uh, through these initiatives. Lastly is the issue of crime um, that IFFs can also be perpetrated through criminal activities the most uh, common is tax evasion but there's also issues of illegal exploitation of resources where companies go beyond the, the limits that they are supposed to go. Uh, this happened especially in mining but also happened in uh, oil and gas. There's also theft um, Depth is the supporting of quantity and quantities uh, of petroleum that certainly affects the yield. And uh, this is not new in Nigeria. A study done between 20, 2001 and 2008 found that about 300,000 barrels of oil were lost oil in a single day. Uh, but just again, at a declaration by just 1% um, in the case of Uganda, this is just one production block, EA1. Uh, a study has found that that could easily result in a loss of about United States dollars, 112 million. Uh, the other aspect of um, crime is uh, illegal exploitation, where non compliance with environmental standards. That companies are supposed to comply with certain environmental standards, but sometimes they actually don't, and that cost that they serve, uh, serve on, uh compliance then becomes the source of IFF. Um, this is the last. Corruption, of course, we all know that um, corruption is a huge issue here. Abuse of entrusted power for private gain. Um, and resource rich countries suffer more because there's a tendency again to uh, waste a lot of discretion in the exclusivity and, of course, political interference in the sector. Now, it becomes the source of IFF where bribes are paid on offshore accounts of officials. Um, and we have had this allegation since 2011, I think on the floor of parliament, of course the ministers were clear, um, but as we shall later see, um, again, very recently, one of the other ministers uh, was implicated. Um, and so it happens in that area where bribes are paid on offshore accounts, but also uh, where companies pay bribes to save on tax and other revenue payments. So this happens in negotiation of the production sharing everything, where they pay officials uh, just for the purpose of saving. Um, global financial integrity estimates that Uganda loses about 1 billion uh, United States dollars per year. Of course, we have a robust legal and institutional framework, but the issue has been political interference and uh, lack of will. And the severe issue, like I mentioned, I think late 2019, you had the US um, Southern District Court of New York um, indict or implicate one of the um, cabinet ministers here for having received a um, technical bribe of 500,000 United States dollars from one of the Chinese oil companies. And that makes it uh, a real worry. That's the summary, I believe, to be in the fact sheet. Um, I'll now turn to the recommendations. If uh, James allows me a minute, I'll run through them. But again, I'm aware that these are well summarized in the uh, information sheet. So, what Uganda needs at this point, drawing from the above, is that they need to expedite on going uh, double taxation agreements, particularly the one with the Netherlands, needs to be uh, revised. 
urgent renegotiation of existing PSAs, uh, production sharing agreements are agreements between two persons, like governments. They are, there's nothing that stops the government of Uganda from renegotiating these uh, PSAs in light of changed circumstances. Enhance the capacity and ability of UIA, Inspector General of Government, or is, yeah, IG, Bank of Uganda, OAG, FIA, because these are all critical players. Um, certainly a need for renewed and production efforts. Um, enactment of a dedicated law for EITI operationalization. Um, we also need for immediate publication of past existing and all future PSS. Um, in light of oil theft, adopt appropriate metering and signature certification mechanisms. Need to set no prices for oil. Enact beneficial ownership rules uh, to establish underlying ownership of companies. But importantly, companies <coughs> should embrace principles of responsible business and respect environmental and social standards. Um, thank you very much, James. I, I know I've overshot, um, mm -hmm. but this was quite a big study and I've been struggling to sort of narrow it down. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Doctor, for reducing the uh, almost 70 pages into 15 minutes. And uh, on our desks, we all have uh, copies of two information sheets. Uh, one uh, titled Illicit Financial Flows in Uganda by Accord and Global Financial Integrity. And uh, another uh, entitled Illicit Financial Flow Risk Factors in Uganda's Oil and Gas Sector uh, by Cisco and Oxfam. Uh, you can uh, get some of the insights from uh, presentations made by uh, Lakshmi and uh, uh, Dr. Dan. Uh, before I call the next panelist, I would like to recognize uh, the members uh, present uh, physically and uh, online. We have uh, about over 30 participants online. Uh, thank you very much for joining. And uh, uh, here physically, we also have about uh, 30 or 25, uh, including representatives from government uh, agencies uh, who will also be sharing some of their perspectives in the plenary. Uh, these include the Petroleum Authority of Uganda, Financial Intelligence Authority, Uganda Registration Services Bureau, the EITI Secretariat, and the Ministry of Energy, among others. We also have a representative from civil society and uh, the fourth estate, the media. So this is a very rich conversation and we believe uh, beyond this, the conversation is going to be uh, spreading and uh, we continue this debate. Uh, so the next panelist is uh, from uh, the government end, having had uh, from uh, Global Financial Integrity and uh, uh, Dr. Dan Gavirano. Uh, um, allow me to invite uh, Mr. Michael Olport, uh, the Deputy Executive Director for Financial Intelligence Authority, to share with us what, uh, in respect to the risks that are posed uh, by illicit financial flows and some of the reports and findings that have been uh, coming over time, what are those, uh, what are some of the measures government has put in place what are the initiatives the Financial Intelligence Authority is working on and for agencies like uh, FIA that uh, don't go to the media all the time. Sometimes we're not here what they're doing, but there's a lot of amazing work uh, they are doing behind the scenes to make sure that we don't lose revenue. Uh, so he will also share with us briefly the role that uh, Financial Intelligence Authority uh, plays. Uh, over to you, uh, Mr. Michael. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, moderator. Um, colleagues present and those attending virtually. Um, my role has been simplified really um, because we, what Lakshmi uh, covered and uh, what um, Dan um, has gone through. Um, as born there, really what 
the ifs are or what the vulnerabilities are or what the drivers are. I will therefore only concentrate on what uh, the Financial Intelligence Authority is doing and uh, um, complementing what other agencies are doing. As you are aware, the authority is still young. It was established in 2013 by the by under section 18 of the Anti-Money Laundering Act of 2013. And the role of the Financial Intelligence Authority in combating illegal financial flows is legally embodied under the uh, objectives for which the authority was established. It is indicated under section 19 of that act uh, briefly they include uh, enhancing the identification of um, sources of crime and combating money laundering enhancing public awareness and understanding of matters related to money laundering ensuring compliance with the act making information collected by it available to competent authorities and to facilitate the administration and enforcement of the laws of Uganda and exchanging spontaneously or upon request any information with uh, similar bodies uh, of other countries that may be relevant for the processing of uh, or analyzing of information relating to money laundering or terrorist financing. So within the existing um, um, frameworks, FIA undertakes its role in the fight against uh, illicit financial flows through interventions that involve basically effective cross-border cooperation. Here we are on a financial action task force uh, style regional body. Um, so we're a member of SM Lab, the East and Southern African Anti-Man Laundering Group, composed of uh, um, 18 member countries uh, in East and Southern Africa. We are also uh, recently last year joined the Egmont, a group of financial intelligence units um, that is now composed of 166 financial intelligence authorities around the world, which extend, exchange uh, critical uh, financial information related to the movement of um, uh, criminal uh, uh, funds and uh, information. Uh, um, for purposes of uh, combating uh, crime. Um, there is also intervention with respect to effective domestic intelligence cooperation. Uh, we have signed um, MOUs with the URA, uh, Secretary of Government, uh, Police CID, Office of Directors of Public Prosecution, and the Wildlife Authority, Uganda Registration Services um, Board. Uh, Directorate of Citizenship um, in means of Internal Affairs. Uh, all those are intended, although not referred by law, but they are intended to strengthen confidence in exchanging uh, information and uh, deepening inside the cooperation uh, in this regard. Um, the intervention, the other intervention is enforcement uh, of reporting by reporting entities. The Act requires uh, accountable persons or reporting entities to file certain reports. These include um, uh, suspicious transaction reports, um, uh, cross border uh, large cash transaction reports, cross border movement of currencies and negotiable bearing terms, and cross uh, and large cash, 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 cash transaction cash reports. Cash. Now, through now, these, through we are the, able to analyze and identify. Um, uh, illicit movements of, 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 of finances and other crimes that um, have been reported to us by the reporting entities. And of course, um, the entities uh, will also enforce um, those entities, that is reporting entities, according to the law, to detect, um, deter illegal activities uh, a majority of these activities, as you are aware, thrive uh, due to lack of transparency, uh, financial secrecy, including shell companies and uh, tax havens. They also thrive due to inadequate reporting on payments and financial transactions. 
and also due to lack of clarity and information on beneficial ownership uh, done as the um, uh, and look and look have gone deeper into what uh, beneficial ownership is and inadequate and uh, quite weak sanctions now the key preventive measures that the authority authority monitors for compliance by accountable persons um, especially regulated financial institutions um, include the implementation of customer due diligence including enhanced due diligence for politically exposed persons, record keeping requirements by um, these institutions, reporting um, uh, um, suspicious transaction reports as I've already alluded, undertaking risk assessments within the institutions of their vulnerabilities development of internal policies, procedures, and controls, including ensuring effective audit function to test the systems. And last but not least, ensuring ongoing employee uh, training, including management and the boards. Now, we, we monitor compliance of the accountable persons um, on, on these issues. But what is also important is that as a country, um, we spearheaded and we undertook um, in 2017, a national risk assessment. And the report is available on our website. Now that national risk assessment um, revealed exactly what um, um, Done and um, and uh, Lakshmi uh, uh, had already alluded to. The reason is that the key major crime generating crimes in Uganda include uh, tax crimes. That is um, tax um, uh, evasion and avoidance. <coughs> they also include uh, corruption. and also include um, a fraud, and that is of course goes under general for crimes. So in terms of, 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 of amounts of illicit financial um, inflows generated, those are the key areas that fall exactly um, and as observed by the study. Now, through the above measures that we um, um, enforce, FIA is continuing to be part of the solution, therefore to strengthen regional and international cooperation, uh, to enhance transparency, especially in the operations of financial institutions, to reform legislations to eliminate uh, financial secrecy and provide full disclosure of beneficial ownership um, uh, uh, beneficial ownership of, of, of companies um, I'm, I'm sure a representative from Uganda Raven, uh, Uganda registration services um, bureau uh, will talk more what they are exactly doing to train and build financial investigative and prosecutorial capacities which are uh, uh, in dire uh, shortage and to address weaknesses in institutional and legal frameworks, including enforcement of punitive sanctions and the recovery of illegally obtained assets. Now, as you may be aware, one of the issues um, for, 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 for some of the colleagues who are familiar, um, Uganda is currently being put under enhanced um, um, monitoring by the Financial Action Task Force, because uh, when we undertook the mutual evaluation of our system, um, it was found in 2016, um, the weaknesses, and one of the weaknesses for which now we are put under the gray list is that relating to the beneficial ownership. Um, so uh, we are addressing that, and uh, as I said, um, a colleague, um, the Registration Success Bureau uh, will touch on 
the details on what they are doing. But the requirement is, as, as I've mentioned earlier, is that addressing beneficial ownership ultimately has the effect of enhancing transparency uh, in the operations of the institution. Now, some of the key challenges in fighting um, illicit financial flows and in general, um, which I'll, I'll end by this one, um, include, uh, uh, in our view, lack of uh, uh, a coherent policy and central coordinating institution uh, in the government in the fight against illicit financial flows. Um, um, I don't know whether uh, Dan in the study uh, they noted uh, any institution that is taking lead in this, but we have found ourselves in FIA at the uh, dilemma because we are assumed to be the ones, and yet illicit financial flows are actually much more beyond because the drivers uh, go beyond our mandate and, and therefore giving us <laughs> Uh, this is the um, more over and above. So the, the lack of a champion, we are trying to engage with the Minister of Finance and um, uh, we hope that they will take this. They have, all, of course, uh, handled it only through one aspect, through, uh, domestic resource mobilization, but it is uh, wider than that. In, in, in a conference we, that was uh, held last week by UNODC, uh, together with UNCTAD, they are now establishing a framework to be able to measure uh, illicit financial report, uh, flows and countries will be required to report them uh, regularly, the amount of illicit financial flows in accordance with the requirements of the <coughs> SDG 16.41. Which requires countries to uh, to, minim, uh, to reduce illicit financial flows in order to freeze funds for development. So within that framework, we hope that uh, um, uh, the government will institute um, a central uh, body that should be monitoring and, and, and solve illicit financial flows. But having said that, um, the the need to have uh, a coordinating institution that um, coordinates both uh, activities that generate uh, the drivers like commercial activities, corruption, crime, and the rest uh, is, is very important. There is also lack of a framework of coordinating um, mutual uh, legal assistance, uh, mutual legal assistance that has already been highlighted in the study. Uh, uh, weak domestic cooperation framework, especially among law enforcement agencies. Um, we have a shortage of uh, financial investigative and prosecutorial skills. Uh, there is also an issue of uh, inadequate resources available for law enforcement agencies. And as the, um, uh, the previous uh, presenters indicated, the existence of unfair trade uh, uh, unfair double taxation agreements uh, with very serious loopholes, um, especially with our biggest trading partners um, who will have um, double taxation agreements with India, South Africa, uh, 10 of them, um, Netherlands, Italy, Belgium, which, which have already been mentioned. And, and, and we feel that there is um, uh, compelling need to have this reviewed in order to identify uh, unfair clauses and, and, and remove them in order to curb illicit financial flows. There is also uh, uh, the challenge which uh, we have noted as uh, the one of aggressive pursuit to attract foreign direct investment on the part of government. Um, uh, uh, in, in, in this way, they provide very generous tax exemption and, 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 I, and I think this is one area that um, the conversation also needs to touch on in terms of policy on how do we um, attract uh, foreign direct investment without uh, um, providing more general exemptions that um, uh, contribute to a large uh, outflow of these resources. And, and, and then finally, we noted that uh, 
uh, finally, but not least, the lack of a comprehensive asset uh, recovery legislation. Uh, I think this is uh, an area which is a work in progress, and uh, I don't have details, but it is being spearheaded by the, the, the Ministry the Directorate of Ethics and Integrity. Um, uh, maybe the fund from sectors of government, which, which is also working hand in hand, they could give on uh, how far they are going on this. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, these are the key challenges that we have noted, and uh, uh, I wish to thank you for listening to me. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Report uh, for sharing uh, some of the insights, and uh, you highlighted what the Financial Intelligence Authority is doing, and uh, also highlighted what the general public is expecting or other entities are asking of the Financial Intelligence Authority, which uh, as an authority you believe uh, is uh, over and above uh, your mandate uh, and I think that's a, a conversation we need to have as uh, you pointed out in the uh, conclusion and some of the recommendations or things that you've noted such as the lack of a coherent policy on uh, this issue and also the absence of a central coordinating uh, entity or agency for government uh, work on this issue. Uh, these are all very pertinent uh, conversations, which I believe from uh, this space, the 60 or 65 uh, of us uh, physically and virtually in this meeting can start pondering upon and uh, coming up uh, with uh, some of the ideas or recommendations on how these things can be addressed. And uh, I think uh, um, Mr. Olpot ably proposed that maybe the uh, Minister of Finance could uh, take on the coordination role and so on. But uh, it, his uh, remarks come at a time when we are opening up to the uh, plenary for the rest of the members, both uh, online and uh, uh, physically here to share their thoughts on the issue. But as we open up, I would like if it's uh, fine with uh, uh, the members here to first uh, give an opportunity, uh, Dean, there is an extra microphone, if we could, yes. There is, uh, we have representation from uh, Uganda Registration Services Bureau, and uh, uh, Miss Patricia, uh, we would like to know if uh, you don't mind, would you uh, share a little more about what uh, URSB is doing, especially on the issue of beneficial ownership, because it came through in uh, Lakshmi's presentation, uh, Dr. Angavirano's presentation, and also uh, Mr. Olupot I emphasized it. What is uh, the Uganda Registration Services Bureau as the go-to place that would, we would start this uh, action from? What is uh, URSB doing on around beneficial ownership and, uh, uh, and IFFs? Uh, please, at the back, which is... Yeah, and I think uh, we have also a representative of the head of the EITI Secretariat, which I believe has uh, some is having conversations on uh, beneficial ownership and uh, beneficial ownership register, so she can also share her thoughts after that. Thank you, Patricia. Yes, thank you, Professor. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Patricia Oboka from URSB. At URSB, um, the Registrar General is one of the accountable persons mentioned under the second schedule of the anti money laundering act. So we are under needs on partnership and uh, legal arrangements. Legal persons and arrangements. So um, at the moment, we are currently amending the company act. In amending the company act, uh, we are required to have a definition section on what beneficial ownership is, a provision requiring all companies to provide uh, beneficial ownership, and then we shall have regulations therein where we shall uh, list uh, the kinds of transactions that uh, will be 
um, required to give us that extra information. In the interim, as the legal process goes on, because it's not a short-term thing, we have internal guidelines that we implemented as of 26 August last year. And um, amongst the things we look out, uh, companies that are being operated, the shareholders, the members, if there's a, a beneficial owner behind, they're supposed to declare. And then we have transactions. We have those uh, transactions, transfers, increases, changes. You will notice that you might have companies that will incorporate today. After two weeks, we'll change their name. So we need to know why are you doing that? And you must be disclosed. And then we have um, multiple registrations where we have, uh, if we notice that uh, one individual is, uh, has numerous not, uh, incorporations, we also require more than one company we actually require you to provide the information and uh, transactions over 100 million. Uh, we are closely working with the NGO Bureau, especially for the NGOs, and then FIA, and then um, part of the things we are also going to amend in our law are the share warrants to bearers, because it's illegal, it's a way of hiding information, so that is going to be amended in the law, and shall have a trans uh, transition period for the existing ones to convert them to shares. And then um, together with FIA, they are supposed to provide us with a list of uh, the politically exposed people and then people who have sanctions against them so that we can we can't have them on our register because of the criminal sanctions against them. And then um, all this, all that we're looking at, the legal reform and all, is going to be supported by a new system where we shall have all digital all online. Because when stuff is online, you easy easy to flag as opposed to a manual system where you cannot easily track and know that Patricia has registered five companies in one month or in a certain period of time. And then another thing we shall have, we currently have our information available, searchable. <laughs> However, for this beneficial ownership. Uh, in our new system, we shall have it somewhere so that uh, all competent authorities can easily access it as and when they require. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for by maybe just one more for clarity. You said competent authorities can access the the register where uh, the beneficial owners will be registered. So is it's not open to the public? The public will have to pay such as a a phone payment or a subject. Okay, thank you. And I think that's where uh, Miss uh, Gloria Mugambe comes in from in terms uh, what. Because I understand that EITI is also uh, heading the direction of uh, beneficial ownership register. Uh, maybe you could share a light on that in view of the conversation. Good morning, everyone. My name is Gloria Mugambe. I'm the head of the Uganda National EITI Secretariat. Uganda joined EITI last year on the 12th of August. EITI is the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. It is the global standard for the good governance of extractive sectors, oil, gas, and mining. Uh, we were the 54th country to join. Since then, I think one other country has joined. Uh, so joining EITI comes with a number of implications and requirements. Uh, and one of them is beneficial ownership. So under EITI, all the companies uh, in oil, gas, and mining will have to declare beneficial ownership. We will have to know who are the owners of these companies. And beyond that, as Patricia was explaining, who are the real owners? Who benefits from the transactions that these companies undertake in Uganda? And it's good to know that uh, a lot of work has already been done. So our work will be made easy, I think. All I have to do is pay Patricia a visit, and she will give me that information. Of course, it's not as simple as that, but there we have a beginning, we have a precedent, we have where we are going to start from. Uh, as you know, we have four, 
of by five main companies in oil and gas to start a level. Uh, it is the mining sector where we might be, where we might have to do some a little more hard work in digging to understand who the owners of the companies transacting in mining are and who the beneficial owners are. Uh, I just want to also touch on the issue of contract transparency because under EITI, it became a requirement from 1st of January this year that uh, all contracts that the country enters in this sector, in the extractive sector, oil, gas, and mining, have to be made public. So any new contracts that Uganda enters, uh, especially from the second licensing round that the country has undertaken or undergone, will be made public. Uh, if we do not make them public, then we will be suspended from EITI. So we are fully aware of the implications of joining, and this is something that we must do. Also, any amendment to an old contract that is done after 1st of January this year means that the entire contract must be published. So these are some of the things that we have signed up to, and uh, we hope that uh, we will be able to meet the high standards which we have promised ourselves. Uh, I just wanted, since I have the microphone. A minute. In a minute. Yes, in a minute. That's I, was I wanted to seek clarification from uh, the gentleman from FIA. On, I, I, I wanted to understand better the reason for grey listing, the reason why we have been grey listed under FIA. And he said it was because of beneficial ownership. And I wanted to understand exactly what it is that we had not done that had put us on the grey list. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, starting on the questions. Uh, before we open up uh, to the questions, uh, we have uh, Mr. Tom Ayevare from uh, the Petroleum Authority of Uganda. Uh, he's a manager of economic and financial analysis. Um, the report by uh, Mr. Dr. Dan Gavirano highlighted uh, with a lot of emphasis the oil and gas sector and how risky it is for Uganda now that we are going into production and uh, the, risk, the risks he highlights still exist. We've not yet addressed them as far as I know. What, what is Petroleum Authority and other MDAs in the oil and gas sector doing to see that some of the concerns highlighted uh, in the report are addressed? Um, thank you, James. Uh, and thank you to all the presenters on the panel. Uh, good morning, everyone. As you heard, my name is Tom Ayer Kondo. I'm the manager for economic and financial aspects of Petroleum Authority of Uganda. Uh, first of all, we'd like to appreciate uh, the time taken to develop uh, this research and this report. Uh, we do see some, some value and a lot of value in uh, the work that was done. And I think to speak to your question, I think we, first of all, we need to be careful. Because uh, in our definition of IFS, we're talking about illicit uh, financial flows. We're talking about money that is illegitimately generated, transferred, well, and uh, transferred, and, uh, and value loss between countries. However, some of the things that we have cited in the research are not illegitimate. For example, we have the legal uh, double taxation agreement that we entered as a sovereign state with other countries. Yes, some might not have terms that are as favorable as others, but they are not in, in, in effect um, illegal. So you, you, so you might have uh, difficulty having an, 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 an international, uh, um, uh, an international understanding that that is an IFF. But that not being said, it is something that we flagged and uh, raised to the Ministry of Finance, and that, and that and a number of other domestic tax agreements, as you have highlighted in the paper, are currently being renegotiated. There are other aspects around the PSAs, uh, and them being unequal. Once again, we, we feel uh, that that is not a true reflection of the reality. Uh, as many of you will know, the IMF, and even some of your partners in civil society, for example, uh, I think Global Witness had a study in 2014 
uh, where, 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 and I think it's it is titled a good deal more bad. So sorry, a good deal better, right? And, and it highlights that, you, that that Uganda as a country has some of the world class theses around the world, uh, and, the, and the aspects that you raise around stabilization. Yes, we have those clauses are there. They do not prevent us as a sovereign state from amending our laws to increase the tax rate. All they do is pro provide an opportunity for the investor to seek some sort of recourse because they had a legitimate economic expectation. And uh, we it provides for that back and forth discussion. So yes, the stabilization clauses are there, but they are not in effect to freeze. They are what they, they are what we call it in the industry uh, equilibrium stabilization process. Uh, I may not go so much into the detail, but there are other aspects around base, base erosion that you highlighted, and we feel we have a very robust legal and regulatory framework where we work with the, with the Office of Operator General, as you highlighted, to highlight some of those inflation costs if they are there, uh, and then bring them up to the attention of the various uh, members of the country and government. There are some things I may not be able to speak to, things like uh, corruption and crime. Uh, I, I, I think those are evident in every country. However, I would, I would just again advise us to be cautious because uh, correlation, for example, if um, in Africa and the various countries that have mineral resources, uh, uh, if there has been an occurrence of IFS, right? And there's also an, an occurrence of, um, of, of entities that are incorporated in safe havens. It doesn't necessarily mean that one will cause the other. It simply means that they are correlated and they appear together. Uh, and I think the last point I would like to make on the two things that you talked about, I think one on beneficial ownership, as an institution we, pay, we play a very big role. Uh, we regulate the sector and we are fully aware of the corporate structures of all the companies that do partake in the industry in Uganda. This is information that is available and we have made to all levels uh, of, of government. Uh, we also have what, what we do call a national supplier database where all uh, local and foreign entities that provide goods and services to the sector are registered, which is free. And we have visibility of the corporate structures of all those entities, so we know all the owners. Uh, and then this is information that we can get the aware uh, as and when may, may, may be required. The last aspect I'll touch on is uh, contract transparency. I think this is something that has been enshrined in our legal framework, as many of you will know, from the National Oil and Gas Policy of 2008 under Objective, uh, objective 6. Uh, we planned from as way back as 2008 to be members of, uh, of the EITR. And in even in the oil and gas revenue management policy of 2013, this was a core aspect uh, that was identified. And as has been shared uh, by Ms. Gloria, sorry, I don't know if it's Ms. I, I, I'm not sure if it's Ms. Or it's Ms. Yes, it's Mrs. Gloria. Uh, we are now members of EITI and we have made progress and inroads in that. And I think it's just a testament to the commitments that we made in the various laws and policies and we're simply for doing that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, indeed, the Uganda's joining EITI at the end of last year was uh, proof uh, or a sense of commitment towards ensuring transparency in the extractive industry, that's oil, gas, and mining. And uh, he has uh, posed uh, a question, which I believe, uh, Dr. Dan, in your last uh, three or five minutes, you will have to shed more light on the issue of illicit, the fact that we are talking about illicit transactions and uh, some transactions are highlighted are not legit, are legitimate transactions. So are we discussing illegal transactions or there is uh, a line between illegal, illicit, that's uh, some English that the doctor will teach us. <laughs> yeah, uh, without further ado, I'm going to open up to the, for comments, 
uh, both uh, here and online. Those online, you can either put them in the chat or raise your hand. We shall take about two or three hands from online and we shall take uh, three or four from uh, those physically present. I see uh, Miss Jane, uh, Jane Nalunga's hand is up. Then we shall follow with Lynn, then Joseph, and uh, finally Henry. Yes, uh, let's keep it brief. We are closing into our time. Okay, um, um, thank you so much, James. Um, and thanks to all the presenters and the people who are to do this um, studies. Um, I have two comments. One, as the issue which has been raised by the previous speaker on the issue of illicit and illicit. I'm not a legal person, but I think we need to address the narrative when we are talking about IFFs and broadening it. Because for us as civil society, as Ugandans, anyway, the whole issue are that is the outflow of resources out of our country. Whether they are illegal or legal, we need to look at that. So maybe mm -hmm. we need to rethink that narrative and go back to the issue of capital flight when we talk about IFF and capital flight. Because what we want is to retain those resources inside our country. Uh, another issue too. Maybe you stand up uh, okay. if you don't mind. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's, that's okay. Yes. Uh, another issue which has been raised by Mr. Report is the issue of uh, investment. What we are talking about are investment issues. And I think we need also to consider looking at the legal frameworks around the, our investment. Look at the investment code. We already have a bilateral investment treaty with the Netherlands, which expired and negotiations are, are there is, but we need to look at the investment frameworks. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. And uh, Lynn is right next. Uh, Dean can give you sanitizer. Yes. Okay, so just quickly to uh, Lynn Gitu from Impact. Um, I, I just wanted to flag the issue of the mining sector and the fact that the mining sector law is, is under review and I think should be appearing before Parliament. I think that creates an opportunity for, for us to include um, uh, provisions around illicit financial flows. I think it would be important that uh, everyone in the room and online keeps that in mind. Because 90% of, of our mineral production in the country is, is um, realized by the artisanal and small scale mining subsector. And this subsector, of course, is very vulnerable to beneficial ownership issues. So, who is actually putting money into a small association to allow them to, to realize? One kilogram of gold, and then how does it how does it leave the country and so on and so forth? So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, we can go to Joseph, uh, Louis online. Uh, we are going to be coming to you. If there are any other online participants that uh, would like to share comments, you can put your hands up. We so far have one. We'll be getting others. Yes. Thank you to the previous speakers. Um, Joseph Yomhaji and I connect the Uganda Consortium of Corporate Accountability. From the discussions, it's very clear that corporate entities are at the center of illicit financial flows. And for us to be able to hold them accountable, access to information is crucial. I'm glad that Patricia from Uganda Registration Services Bureau indicates that they're having a review of the company's act. And just like Lynn has noted, also in the mining sector, they are reviewing the laws. We need to be very intentional to flag the issue of access to information of the beneficial owners. Because without that, it would be very hard for us to pursue them and hold them accountable. Because the more money that is lost to the beneficial owners, Ugandans end up losing on quality public services. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Yes, uh, Henry. Uh, thanks, James. Uh, my name is Amir Basir, and I work with the Water Government Institute. I just have a 
three, three questions on, on COVID. And the uh, first one is basically to our FIA and uh, our colleagues in government. You talked about well, what? Is that the name? You, you said that there is spontaneous information exchange between Uganda and other collaborating countries on, 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 the, on taxpayers that are operating in the different jurisdiction. I observe that we are having problems with the partners who exchanging information from OECD countries. And I think that applies to any other regions. So I'm wondering how our colleagues in government are handling that because you will may be very generous, as we are generous always in the FDI, by giving out information about tax personalities, and then it takes us for ages to get the same favor from the, the other colleagues of ours. The then question is, how does the FIA avoid political interference or influence for them to slap or to freeze or suspect somebody's money to be um, illegal or suspicious. How do you strategize to avoid that? That question is on asset recovery. I think I saw something in the news where somebody's assets were recovered. Under what legal framework were those assets recovered? What frameworks are we putting in place to recover assets from high net worth, politically connected people who have assets abroad? And then my comment is, uh, keep it brief. We have a request for FDI as a country, and we have begun as becoming very smart and going out to register as international companies, and coming back as international companies, when actually individuals, the beneficiary owners, are residents of Uganda. How do we deal with that? And they benefit of the tax incentives. And what strategies are we put in place to safeguard that kind of problem? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are going to move uh, to our online participants, uh, Louis. Louis Kizito, you can unmute yourself and uh, share your comment, please. Yes, hello. Can you, I, I'm sure you can hear me. Yes, we can. All right. I'm going to speak as some young person who is uh, in the who is involved in uh, financial innovation, tech startups, and that kind of thing. Now, briefly, this is my comment. I have. I think my former lecturer Dan Gabirano, who elucidated on the illicit financial flows, but I am afraid that illicit financial flows are going to be used to stifle innovations in our area of work as people who innovate in the technology world. You realize that much as there is a semblance of fraud in things like cryptocurrencies, which by the way, I expected this, uh, this gathering to, call, uh, to talk about, because recently there, are two, there is a major legislation that happened in parliament. They, uh, I think the Financial Intelligence Authority sought leave of uh, of parliament to include uh, virtual asset service providers as a part of the list of uh, accountable persons, which is true and it's good. But I'm afraid that with the laws, laws, laws coming up, like the recent amendment to the Anti-Money Laundering Act, I think the fourth should you to include people who are dealing with cryptocurrencies as accountable persons. Then we also have the national payment system law. I'm afraid we should actually draw a uh, a fine line and I think balance between the need to regulate and uh, regulate and prevent illicit financial flows and not to stifle you know, innovation because you realize that after the financial crisis of 2008, and I'm going to be very brief, I don't want to be very, uh, I don't want to go on forever, but after the 2008 financial crisis, we realized that decentralized finance became the thing now. We have, uh, I, mean, I don't want to veer so much into cryptocurrency, but we have what to call the blockchain technology, which can enable financial transactions around the world without these financial intermediaries called banks. Now, 
I am uh, what I'm just calling for is let us not veer so much into over regulation. Because for me, I'm general counsel of a tech startup, and I know the, the problems we go to. Recently, uh, Safe Border had problems data sharing, but the most important thing to do with illicit, fi illicit financial flows now is that they have an, a holding company structure in Mauritius, which they use to, as an investment vehicle in Uganda. The reason why tech startups do that is that the, 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 it is capital intensive to run a tech startup. So you may not want to dodge uh, taxes, but you may want to have an environment where your dividends are not taxed, where your employee employment, uh, what they call uh, employee stock options, because some of us cannot compensate employees with money. So we, uh, we have to advise things like stock options. We cannot convince investors that we have a very good investment climate for them to put money in our tech startup. So we end up, or oh, like Safe Border has done, it has a Safe Border holding in Mauritius. They take advantage of the Mauritius double taxation to not to avoid taxes, not to I minimize taxes, but you know, the things that startups do and the financial model, venture capital, all these things require a good environment, which you do not have. So as I conclude, we should address two things in this discussion. The need to regulate and avoid financial, illicit financial flows, but then not to stifle innovation, because that's where the future is. Let's find a good environment for, and I was happy that uh, Minister of Finance came up with the, what they call the blockchain free trade zone area, the citrus instrument where you can develop a blockchain pr product with a, with a free trade area, but that is not enough. We need to give these people, young people, and we have a very big full population, which can, uh, which is, if not employed, can be a very good time bomb for this country. So thank you, but as I conclude, I am I kindly indulging you people in this gathering not to use illicit financial flows as a magic wand to stay for innovation. Because once we stay for this innovation, we might lag behind. Kenya actually is a FinTech hub now in emerging in this continent. Can't we compete? Uh, that is all I had to say. Thank you very much. And I would, I would love to thank my former lecturer, Dan Gabriano, for his uh, contribution. At, uh, thank you very much. My name is Louis Chizito. Uh, thank you, Louis, for sharing uh, your insights and uh, for thanking your lecture. We are also grateful to share him here. <laughs> Yes, uh, he raises very pertinent issues. Uh, we had thought we would have at least three uh, people online and they have not, uh, those online have not put their hands up. So I think no, it, they would be showing at the top. Yeah, we are James. going to allow, yes. Uh, Sorry, Lakshmi. James. Uh, no, I just want to let you know, there are a couple of people have asked questions in the chat function. Okay, yeah, so yeah. I'm going uh, those in the chat, and then I can allow Ronald from the Independent and uh, Andrew from Resource Rights Africa, and then we come back to the panelists and conclude. Uh, Mojisha Imam uh, in the chat box uh, says, uh, absence of fiscal rules on withdrawal from petroleum fund is not helping proper management of oil revenues, and again, according to the to Canary's documentary, that's I hope uh, MBS uh, documentary on corruption in Uganda, we see and judge that Uganda for long hasn't been able to deal with corrupt individuals, yet it's one of the one way for IFFs. It is feared that we, we won't be able to tackle IFFs to the full capacity. Thank you. Then, uh, uh, Evelyn Muendo says, will the beneficial ownership laws be limited to only companies? What about trusts and other legal arrangements? Otherwise, the steps towards enacting beneficial ownership laws are commendable. Uh, yes, uh, I think that there is quiz error. Yes, uh, Quizera, my concern is about legislation, implementation and enforcement towards illicit financial flows. Issue of mining sand, locks and other minerals, rocks, I mean, rocks and other minerals, how are issues of the royalties handled? Minimum wage in case of foreign direct investment in our country, which, is, which are exempted from taxes and how much of the profits from the international oil companies, I think, should be repatriated. 
Yes, those are the few we got online. Uh, if there is uh, any other, we shall uh, flag it. But uh, our time is first spent. We are going to give Ronald a minute and then uh, Andrew a minute so that we can go back to our panelists to share their parting shots and respond to some of the questions. Uh, thank you, James. Uh, my, my, my question was to Mr. Albert from uh, FIA. I don't know if there's a question, maybe uh, uh, a comment, and then we you know, decide whether it's a question or not. You, in, in your presentation, you mentioned something, I think what you're right, that uh, I think one of the challenges you are grappling with is or Uganda for that matter is grappling with is that uh, is the, we don't have a central body to sort of help you maybe do your work better or that you okay spare help whatever it is and then the other is that you sort of require another coordinating institution to help you do your work better but then for me you left me confused I think fear though we understand it is an authority for playing, uh, playing, playing out loud, you should, I, I, do I understand it? You are the, this body, you are, you want, uh, again, it's like you want government or Uganda to help create another spur structure above you. Yet I think you may understand this is you who is supposed to do most of this work. So the question is, do you lack resources in terms of finance and human resource? or you are just running away from what you're supposed to do. And why don't you just say that? Thanks. Uh, thank you uh, for the question. I don't know whether to thank for the question. But <laughs> uh, I don't know what to say. No. Yeah, but the question is posed. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Mr. Henry also somehow scratched the elephant in the room about uh, which is a question I think uh, Mr. Olpot will answer the risk of uh, being politically moved, uh, looking at uh, the past incidents where in the media or in some circles, especially civil society, I'm not speaking for government, that uh, uh, the authority seems to be going after the small fish that civil society is. So those are things that uh, you can uh, shine some light on. Yes. Uh, Okay, I thank you, James. My name once again is Amarang Rubi Amarang from Global Resource Rights Africa. And uh, my question goes to Dr. Mariano. Uh, in that study, uh, you highlighted a lot of monies that uh, lost at continental level in Africa, but also looking at Uganda in particular. I'm wondering whether we can identify the global enablers of this illicit financial flows or uh, in that particular study or um, we, we still have a challenge in that and what are the mechanisms to uh, to handle these global enablers such that we can mitigate some of these uh, uh, illegal uh, financial flows out of our economy which we need dearly. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are going to move back to our panelists. And I think, uh, Lakshmi, we shall uh, use the same order. Uh, I, I actually believe the question from Louis is uh, something you can uh, help us with, as the rest of the panelists can also comment on the same. Uh, thank you. Over to you, Lakshmi. Uh, you're on three minutes. Four um, marks. Yes. Oh, the one thing you, James, you should know, I'm scrupulous about making sure I stay within time. So no worries there. Um, but no, this has been fascinating. I think the remarks that everyone's spoken about, I think has really enriched the conversation. So I think I have, I've learned just as much from being on the panel and hearing everyone. With that said, I just want to sort of quickly touch upon, um, I think, the, the very relevant comment that Louis, uh, Louis made about sort of, you know, innovation and um, a regulation, sort of where does the balance lie? And the one thing I will say is that, you know, as you talk about cryptocurrency, I think Uganda is a great example because Uganda, not just Uganda, but especially Uganda, because the one of the <coughs> largest cryptocurrency money laundering Ponzi scams globally, Uganda was the main victim of it. It was a 4 billion US dollar scam called OneCoin. 
which affected everyone from the US to Europe, the Middle East, and especially it affected a lot of Ugandans that very often were sort of, you know, uh, did not necessarily have the socioeconomic means. And so I think that as much as we talk of, as much as there's the emphasis on um, uh, an innovation, I think, you know, we also have to think about the environments in which regulation is operating. If there are not as many, um, it's, it's, if, the pop, if individuals are not as well aware of the risks of some of these financial products, there is rate, greater opportunity for sort of fraud and abuse. And I, and I think Lewis is right when he says there is a balance. But I think what we're often dealing with, with some of these tech, newer technologies is that as very often technology develops quicker than regulation and you're often playing catch up is that we are essentially a lot of the times operating in an environment where there is the absence of regulation. So as opposed to over-regulation, I would actually make the case that a lot of the problems we are seeing here is because we are still, most, most regulation globally is playing catch up and we're really operating in an absence. Um, I just wanted to sort of, again, point on the beneficial ownership is that I think one of the things that should, we should consider is one is what you want to avoid is the multiplicity of beneficial ownership definitions. Because, you know, I think we have talked about the business registry. There's already one beneficial ownership law sort of on the books, you know, uh, in a lot of uh, income tax sort of for, um, agreements, there's a beneficial ownership law concept. Now, if the mining bill were to come out with a new thing, I think the thing that you want to avoid above all else is multiple definitions of beneficial ownership because that will just create, will, will create problems in enforcement. And we've seen that happen in many other countries. And um, the last thing is that, you know, I think when you're talking about access, um, it's not just access, but I think we also want to talk about timeliness of access, which is how quickly it can be accessed, what information is covered, what entities are covered. And it's not just entities that open a bank account. It's not just entities that are invested in all, or have contracts in the oil and gas sector, or mining sector, because very often companies, if you look at the supply chain, can just be used to hold a real estate asset, can be used to hold some other kind of asset through which you can move. So I think the beneficial ownership law should cover all entities that are created and registered in Uganda, but especially when you're talking about foreign investment, you want to have foreign entities that are registered to do business in Uganda. So even if they are created outside Uganda, you want to make sure that the foreign entity also provides beneficial ownership information that is held within Uganda and not with a foreign regulator. Because I think you know, we've, I think the uh, Mr. Michael talked about the problems with sort of you know uh, mutual legal assistance, and we want to, that's the best way to sort of avoid that. And I will stop there. I think I, I, I think I did not cross the. Floor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you you responded to the question, but maybe. Uh, since we may not come back to you, uh, any what any parting shots? What are the action points? Anything's going forward beyond uh, this conversation? Uh, what is, uh, and I think also Nesmas will be sharing on behalf of uh, Accord and GFI. What are some of the things going forward in respect to this uh, debate on illicit financial flows? I think, I think that you know the one thing is I think you know the, as we talk about illicit and illegal, I just want to leave the thought saying that that debate has not yet been, is, is not settled because there are, I think, you know, different perspectives, whether it's an African perspective, whether it's an, so, but I think the one thing to consider is that there is sort of an international standard. And I think the definition that Accord and GFI use in our information packet is the definition that the World Bank, the UN, UNODC, and every body that works in this area does it. I think the future really is if, you know, there are governments don't have, unlimited resources, they have limited resources. And I think it's to find the best policy options to push forward. And I think in the multiplicity of issues that we've spoken today, I think really figuring out beneficial ownership, the implementation of that, the access piece of that, I think is critical to sort of touch on almost every area that we've covered then. I, and I and I think, you know, that's where I think, you know, I, I'd like to think that our code and GFI want to push the bulk of our efforts into, because I think the reality of that will transform the reality of almost everything else that we're talking about here today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lakshmi. Uh, we can now go to uh, Dr. Dan Gavirano to uh, respond to the questions that were posed and also share his uh, parting shots 
in uh, three or four minutes max. Thank you very much, James, and thank you very much for uh, the audience for the questions and insights. Um, I think I do not have many questions to respond to, but uh, there was a quite an interesting debate, I think, emanating from the question from uh, the gentleman from the Petroleum Authority of Uganda. Um, there are, I think, two issues. One is to do with the, the uh, production sharing agreements, and the other is to do with the EPA. I think it cannot be denied that Uganda got a relatively good deal, but I think there's nothing um, um, bad about striving for an even better deal. Um, turning to the, you know, it's absurd that these contracts have not been disclosed, but platform and uh, global witness have widely disclosed these on the other uh, frameworks. And I think um, there are quite two striking things that come from, uh, I think, the rest of the platform. One is that um, I think the PSA in respect to EA1, um, that's between Uganda and Taro, was negotiated at a time when a similar deal was being done across the border in the DRC. Um, Uganda got about 300,000 United States dollars, the DRC got 3 million. And another comparison that was striking there was uh, the deal with Kurdistan, which at the time did not really have a legitimate government but also turned out to have gotten a better deal. So we, we, I think we cannot bury our heads that we could not have gotten a better deal. And, you know, a number of other poorly negotiated uh, clauses have come up. Um, sometime in 2010, I think there was clause that was 235. This is on the in court record because it was contentious, where I think the Minister of Energy then had granted a blanket exemption to the oil companies from payment from capital gains tax. That is an extremely poorly negotiated clause. And we could have lost, not in which sense we lost, because the assessment was about 430 something billion, when that was for 250 million. So there was a loss. So I think there's nothing that stops us. And, and I think this is um, my appeal that we can get a better deal. Um, when it comes to DTS, um, there's a distinction between illegal and illicit. Uh, the definition, I think, in how part in short, which has already pushed us to, uh, you know, the, the kind of definition about movement of money and value from one country to another that are irresistibly, not illegal, but irresistibly. Now, when I did uh, just a quick search, illegal means something that is contrary to the law or forbidden by law, in the sense to be criminal. Irresist means something that not, may not be approved by law, but is not in mind. I think, again, we cannot bury our head. I think there's a lot that is um, inappropriate for a Chinese oil company to come from China, come and invest in Uganda, um, and go through, um, in this case, the Netherlands, just for purposes of maximizing um, its um, profits. I think, because in the first place, the DTA between Uganda and the Netherlands was really to benefit, um, you know, um, citizens or companies in these two countries, there's something quite inappropriate. And, and I think law must evolve. I belong to a school of thought that believe that law must evolve. Um, you know, at some point, genocide was not illegal. At yeah. some point, the uh, appetite was legal. <clears throat> Maybe we should move towards criminalizing some of these, um, um, uh, take them to that, that step, uh, because this is a very important uh, matter. Um, that I think I don't see, um, you know, under the roof. Um, yeah, so I think that was the major key. So we can strive for better in short. Um, a gentleman, yeah, Mr. Rules, which is to unfortunately, this research was limited to oil and gas, and that's where about my competence is stop. I'm not very <laughs> Covers that with fintech. I have heard that uh, blockchain may actually facilitate transparent transactions. I don't know much about that, but certainly that's an area to think through, but it's beyond my competence. Um, I'm sorry I wouldn't uh, comment on that. My parting short is this I think there's nothing, and I should put it very clear, that there's nothing inappropriate about companies making profit. There's nothing inappropriate about that. I think the issue is that they must meet and pay their fair share of taxes. Everyone in this room is taxed. 
um, 30 percent, I can believe, uh, on average. Why should a multinational that makes all these huge profits go away uh, without being that? It's, it's immoral, it's unjust, it can never be justified. And, and for me, that's my parting shot. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor. It's immoral, it's unjust, it can't be justified. And I, I think he puts it the simplest way we can understand. And I think uh, Jen had also highlighted the reference to these IFFs, uh, what the Muganda would say, COVID it's mm -hmm. capital flight. Uh, IFFs is a lot of English, but what, what we are discussing here is capital flight. There is money that would otherwise uh, be coming in that is going out. Whether it's being done illegally or legally is another question, but we are losing while we are trying to tax now withdraw of money from the bank. We've taxed OTT, people have used VPN, and all that is happening, but there are bigger monies that we would be getting that are just passing right in front of us. So, uh, I think uh, Dr. Ngabirano has uh, really put it well that how do we make sure that these corporations pay what is fair? Uh, Louis uh, referred to safe border being registered in Mauritius just for tech reasons, but people who know that there is a DTA between Uganda and Mauritius know that safe border, which is operating here, could have registered here, but it has interest in going to Mauritius. So uh, I'm going to pass uh, the microphone to the last panelist to share and respond to a number of questions, uh, including one from uh, Gloria on uh, Uganda being gray listed and a few others from uh, other members. Over to you and your parting shot as well. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we should thank the, the audience for, for the comments. Uh, starting with the uh, Gloria, why was Uganda placed on the grey list? Um, so Uganda was placed on the grey list on a number of issues, but with respect to what we are discussing, among the issues uh, was inadequate beneficial ownership. Um, specifically, Uganda is requested to strengthen and implement a system of sanctions for violation of beneficial ownership transparency obligations. Currently, um, you are a CD, uh, can, can, can confirm this. Um, there are no uh, sanctions that we have um, for violations of beneficial ownership transparency obligations. Then, secondly, you also require, is also required to demonstrate that competent authorities actually have timely access to accurate, basic, and beneficial ownership information for legal entities held by the company registry and or by regulated entities. Again, that demonstration uh, was not provided to um, uh, assessing entities, and that is those, those are the issues under uh, beneficial ownership that we are working to resolve in order, among others, to move out of the various. Um, Jane com uh, commented about to the need to look at an investment framework of totality and then the, the issue of outflows. Um, uh, I totally agree with that. Um, Henry um, um, was asking about uh, the issue of spontaneous information exchange. Now, in the context of the Financial Intelligence Authority and within our mandate, when I was talking of spontaneous information exchange, I was talking about information exchange um, uh, with respect to exchange between uh, FIA and other FIAs around the world. That is the equivalent institutions around. As I mentioned, there are 166 other financial intelligence units around the world. And we have, they have created a safe uh, exchange network where we exchange information uh, online through the safe and information um, uh, information in the safe information exchange system. Now it is a requirement under our membership that all these countries 
um, in, in share information or exchange information spontaneously. That is, if there is information that will benefit, uh, say, UK FIU, and we notice that the UK entity here has a, is involved in content of our court, do that spontaneously. Or upon a request, that is, if they request for information. So, but the other thing that makes this um, useful, probably, that I did not um, mention is that because of our access to this global network of information, competent authorities and entities in Uganda can also request for beneficial ownership information of other entities based in other countries that they cannot directly acquire, say, from a foreign country. You write the circumstances for FIA, and through this information, we can request the FIA of the UK to look and give us information of a company that is there. The FIA there will give us that information and we pass over to you. It is an important network that avoids the, 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 the procedures of, 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 of the degrees of, of the diplomatic channels and so on, which can take the a long time. Now, of course, with tax, in, with respect to tax, tax issues, Uganda tax also have their own information framework for exchanging tax specific issues. So, which is different from the framework um, that I was talking to. And how does FIA avoid political influence um, to freeze funds and under what legal framework are we uh, recovering assets? Now, the freezing of funds by FIA is provided under the law and under the act. There are two issues that uh, are being confused. The FIA gets information on funds that are flowing through the financial system not cash that is outside the financial system. And you get this information through the reporting entities, basically banks, insurance companies, as, as outlined under Schedule 2 of the Act. So they report those the information to us through suspicious transaction report, large cash transaction, and cross-border uh, movement of currencies that I mentioned. Now, when we analyze the, that information, then we can get leads to suspicious information that is actually true and suspicious information that is not uh, true and that doesn't have leads. So if suspicious information relates and gives us uh, uh, clues that this is a criminal, then we forward that information to an appropriate agency. If it is relating to corruption, we forward it to IGB. If it is relating to uh, um, tax, then we forward it to, to URA. And in fact, since we came into being, um, in the last, especially in the last three hours, the information that we have forwarded to URA has resulted in the reassessment of taxes to a number of entities and the recovery of money, which is now, I think, over 8 billion uh, as a result of the information we give to them. Um, of course, one of the, uh, the, the examples is that a number of people use their personal accounts. They have companies, but they use their personal accounts to do transactions. <coughs> so when the turnover is, is a suspect, then some of those are some of the issues that the URA uh, takes up. So we are not... Up, 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 up. The issue of freezing funds is provided under the law, and we freeze only when it is necessary. There is another element with respect to EF, the terrorist financing. Um, that, of course, was in the, in the papers in the recent past. Now, that, that law has a, a bit of a problem, and we have brought it attention, and that this, this is required. Because if you can relocate your collector, number of it, it was at the height um, when um, the former IGP Kaikura uh, 
was uh, IGP. And the, the initial proposal was to have an IGP to freeze the account. Then the parliament refused that IGP cannot be raised as those accounts. Instead, they um, deleted uh, IGP and inserted uh, uh, FIA. And unfortunately, they did not amend the other sections. Because after it is supposed to be freezing, if it was IGP, you freeze and then you forward it to uh, DPP, and then DPP goes to court. So if they had changed as they did, that we are now the ones to free, they should have changed that after freezing, you don't need now to forward to DPP. You just need now to see the court straight. Up. So because the law provides that we forward to DPP, that's what we did. And DPP said, no, we cannot proceed uh, with this court unless there is evidence from police to provide. So they have to go to the court back to police, and that causes a bit of confusion, but I hope it will be um, sorted out. Now, the legal framework for recovery and assets. The legal framework exists in bits and pieces. As you may uh, be aware, it is the uh, legal framework in the uh, anti money laundering act, and also IG, IGG is using and uh, so. But what we are saying, the framework is not comprehensive enough for purposes that are adequate for the recovery of assets. I'll give you an example. Suppose, um, and you have, you, have, you have known this. Suppose uh, you have seen how um, he found, let's say, what are you? Uh, disappeared in the police. Oh. <laughs> For example, we are going to Ethiopia. Oh, oh, oh. The, the asset is, for example, a hospital or a school. Now, there, are no, there is no law that provides on how that asset will be managed, and the management of the asset, and how it will be used for PDRs and so on. So, and, and also, it is in very respect mainly of uh, criminal case. As, as the, the study, we need to move to uh, non uh, conviction based recovery, which is more effective uh, as uh, our neighbors in, in South Africa and Kenya are. Uh, with respect to Louis Vasp's uh, PS, um, the idea is not to ski for innovation, and indeed, it is not at all. Um, VASPs, uh, that is the virtual asset service providers, was placed by parliament under our purview with respect only to money laundering and terrorist financing. So we are enforcing only that aspect. Again, there is a lacuna in the policy framework for the regulation of um, fintechs and, of course, VASPs. That policy issue has got to be taken by an entity as the Minister Minister of Finance. We are not the regulators of us, but under the law and under international standards, the money laundering countries should ensure that the VASPs are uh, registered and, 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 and they report uh, in accordance with the requirements of the international money laundering standards. That's why we put it under that. But that is only a small aspect. There needs to be a comprehensive entity to regulate us, to provide policy direction, among which we will include um, uh, maybe um, uh, provisions for encouraging the growth of us and, and, and the like. Now, the other issue um, that was is on the, on the beneficial ownership uh, laws of obviously. Um, it goes beyond the companies, and, and, and trusts are also required to, to provide that uh, information. Then Ronald um, 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 Ronald is saying that uh, FIA should not be running out of its so We are not. What I am simply saying that with respect to ifs, that is illicit financial flows, 
the mandate of FIA will be limited if they took this role, because illicit financial flows involve both licit activities and illicit activities. The one for the FIA are more concentrated on illicit activities. So if we are going to do this role, how about licit activities that generate illicit uh, 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 transactions? So for example, for the issue of uh, of double taxation agreements, uh, we cannot now be on championing to amend the laws with respect to those issues. And also, uh, if I may go a bit further, I already mentioned that under the 2063 uh, development uh, agenda for Africa, that of course um, uh, arose from the the big report of 2015. It stresses the role of the country to manage this plan, which is also now reflected in the 23rd agenda under the United Nations. I mentioned under SDG 16.4, where countries are required now to measure and minimize illicit financial flows in order to release resources. Now, when we were in the, the conference last week, countries are supposed to make commitments and to start measuring this. And measuring this illicit it requires coordination because it is a multi form. It requires coordination from a number of entities to generate data that can be required consistent with the, the, the statistical uh, requirements of the UN. So, this is not what can be done by FIA because FIA is a limited operational issue. But these are policy matters that are beyond. So we are not running out, we are on appealing to authorities to, who can manage the policy issues that are wider uh, to look into this. Um, I think, uh, Chair, those, those are the, the ones I managed to. Thank you to. very much. Uh, and uh, maybe in terms of my concluding uh, remarks, I, I think this, um, um, Engagement is, is very useful. Uh, I think you, we need to, to, to continue and fine tune the specialty areas um, that uh, we have identified um, uh, loopholes and agree uh, together uh, on the same uh, on, on the way forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I believe uh, the panelists really deserve quite an appreciation. We are 30 minutes past our mark. I'm going to request that uh, we have uh, Mr. Onesmas Mujeni on behalf of the organizers of uh, this meeting to share uh, a few closing remarks and we'll call it a morning. Uh, Onesmas, you're welcome. Uh, thank you, James. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're already running out of time and I don't want to play you even for a minute. You must agree with me, this has been a very wonderful discussion. And I want to thank you very much, um, participants online and those who are here physically. I want to thank our panelists. I think that's been an exceptional panel. Thank you very much. Thank you for the intervention. The agencies that were able to be here, and that I think the interventions have been very, very, very wonderful. The partnership. Uh, 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 global financial integrity, accord and, uh, and, and, and Cisco. Um, thank you for putting this together and uh, for making this uh, event happen and uh, sharing this uh, information. I, I want to promise that uh, we want to add value. We want to add value and I want to call upon all the agencies, government agencies in this room that we want to add value. And uh, we're going to be organizing strategic meetings, much smaller, much smaller meetings, where we can have a discussion between different agencies so that we ease out some of these issues and see, is it the mandate that actually we need to expand? Uh, um, uh, is it the limited mandate that is uh, uh, limiting the, 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 the operations? Is it something different? But you can also look at specific studies for this study was so broad we can now look at specific studies 
and look at the uh, uh, certain issues that we see, how best can we deal with some of those uh, uh, issues? Um, uh, so I promise that's the area where we can also make uh, a useful uh, contribution. Once again, uh, thanks very much uh, for your time and uh, for your contribution, and we look forward to interacting again. Have a great day. Yes, yeah.